after leaving Tata, it has always been Monday to Friday because Saturday, Sunday, a lot of people travel. I also used to travel pre-COVID. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, right. So now, no traveling, and I don't think we'll travel until uh, summer. No travel. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Two Mumbai cars. Oh, one is afraid. Yes, sir. Because if something happens, you know, everything it becomes a problem at home, problem oh, at yeah. workplace. And nobody wants any kind of disruption now. Yeah, yeah. Sir, Dr. Saikya, sir. Yeah. Can, yeah. I, can I request you to welcome everybody and then we'll start? As chairman of the scientific committee, it is your privilege and our honor. So, thank you. Thank you for this. So, you're muted. Ah, that's what. Yes. Yes. Good afternoon. Good evening to everyone. It's a very important. Uh, day for us. Uh, there are lots of webinars, lots of conferences happening, but this is a special one. And because uh, there's someone from whom we have all learned the basics of oncology. And then, and he's none other than uh, Dr. Adwani. Uh, no one needs to talk anything beyond that. Uh, we all know majority of us uh, participants Younger ones may not have had the opportunity to work with him, but all of us, those who have worked old timers, you know, kind of encouragement that we had that uh, once we entered that uh, place in uh, Tata Memorial Hospital more than three decades ago, and then immediately you realized that you have come to a place that where your career will take off. And I'm sure everyone would agree with that. And the kind of legacy that he has um, uh, that legacy he has, uh, we have the legacy from him that is continuous now. Um, so, sir wanted and said it's very rightfully that there should be some kind of continuation and, and medical education in this field that uh, there will be many more. I'm suppose this is the first one. And the first one has been chosen as a chronic myeloid leukemia. That's the one that uh, uh, used to be a very challenging disease years ago. Now we take it uh, very lightly, most for most of them. But I don't think time has come to take it lightly because there's still plenty of people don't do well with the currently available treatment. But we have come a long distance since the days of using uh, tablet uh, malphalon, uh, alcaron, um, or uh, buzalfan. So those kind of drugs. Um, now even hydroxyurea. So I think uh, so much of uh, advancement in the field that uh, we need to have a kind of dedicated meeting and very appropriately. And thanks to Dr. Purvish Pari and the team for organizing this because it's a lot of work, but we just sit here and then enjoy it. But those who organize it, it's a huge work for them. And they're a very well-oiled team they have and then uh, we are thankful for that. And then uh, uh, we will. We hope that we'll have a great meeting uh, this evening and tomorrow noon and afternoon time. And I hand over the platform to the organizers and Dr. Adwani. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saikya, sir. Uh, now may we request Dr. Adwani to please address uh, all of us. Dr. Adwani, sir. Dear colleagues, I think I'm really proud and I feel privileged to be here at the inauguration of uh, the whole oncology series named after my name. So I think that's a really great satisfaction. And also the feeling of uh, the togetherness that has uh, allowed me to really grow over a period of time in almost last 45 years of uh, the work in the oncology. Uh, when we started oncology, there was no oncology as such. It was basically the physicians who were looking after the patients with the oncology cancers. However, 
over a period of time it went on improving the better and better drug and today you can see that how we have moved forward. This is very clearly seen particularly in a disease like chronic myeloid leukemia. It is one disease which has changed. The whole landmark changes have occurred in this disease. And you can really see that happening. We have what we have seen chronic myeloid leukemia 40 years ago. I think the new generation will never see that chronic myeloid leukemia. That time chronic myeloid leukemia was chronic phase, accelerated phase, and then the blast crisis. And three years, everything is over. That was a chronic myeloid leukemia. Today it is no more like that. Today is all chronic phase and it's chronic phase and elimination of the disease and also patients living longer. And what I thought was the best way to give the inaugural input on this disease would be to show you one of our patients whole history and that will tell you that the whatever progress has occurred you can see in this patient that's a thing. I think important thing. That's why I thought that it will be really appropriate to show you and share with you one of our patients. I am I think she is also trying to join. She has joined already. So I think uh, at the end I'll give her a one or two minutes to talk about it. Now as next slide please. Chronic myeloid leukemia is has been an enigma. That time we when initially we used to diagnose we used to say chronic myeloid leukemia and that time we knew little bit about uh, the chromosome abnormality that Philadelphia chromosome and but we were hardly able to do that and demonstrate that and that time the patients who used to respond we will call it chronic myeloid leukemia who does not respond we say maybe it is not chronic myeloid leukemia that was the situation in those days. And then the journey started. Slowly we learn everything about chronic myeloid leukemia. Not only the treatment change, but the whole understanding of the biology over a period of time became so good that ultimately scientists were able to identify the main area of interest which is responsible for chronic myeloid leukemia and target that and ultimately produce the results successfully. I think that is what the change has occurred. So this has been a real sort of a journey which we have learned. Next slide. What you can see over here, this was our patient, Shaila Bandari. She was, uh, uh, date of birth was 24 October 56. And uh, on the 29th April, 2000, not 2000, 1990, she went for a routine blood test and was diagnosed to have chronic myeloid leukemia. According to her, she was shattered. She had two young daughters. They were 8 and 10 year old and she was really shattered. And then at that time, she came to Tata Memorial Hospital and she was from Jaipur and she knew Dr. Hemant Malhotra who was with us at that time and he sort of brought uh, to our department and that's how her journey started from that day. And that time we had everything whatever available over there. That time we had moved away from the busulfon to hydroxyurea and that was a great sort of a movement considered at that time and therefore she was put on the hydroxyurea and we used to use the hydroxyurea off and on. You give it the hydroxyurea, blood count comes down, stop it and then wait for the blood count to come up and that was the journey that happened. And she went through it nicely and uh, she had all the confidence and the hope that she will be able to pass through this disease. So that's how the whole thing is started for this young lady. Next slide. You will see that uh, over a period of time she received the treatment initially the hydroxyurea in April 1990 
that's the time we were also doing or offering to our patient the allogenic bone marrow transplantation and she was also offered but she had no HLA compat compatible sibling so that part was all in all and I remember uh, Dr. Tappan and uh, the colleagues and all they were very active with chronic myeloid leukemia at that time and the maximum number of transplant were in the chronic myeloid leukemia so that was not possible for her and then somewhere in May 92 we had the interferon and she actually was offered interferon in UK so she went over there took the interferon but her experience with interferon was bad she developed some bacterial infections in those days and had a lot of bad time and therefore discontinued and then she was all right again till 1994 and again she got the full-fledged chronic myeloid leukemia that's the time interferon was available in India so we, we had offered her the interferon and she took it although she had a lot of side effects and in March 96, interferon was stopped due to the extreme physical and psychological trait. That was her experience with interferon. So you can see that how we went from the uh, hydroxyurea to consideration of the transplant and to the interferon. These were the treatment available at that time. Next slide. And in January 2001, this young lady still continued to search and uh, she ultimately a Gleevec was uh, became a very important drug but not available to anybody in India. So she traveled from here to Professor Goldman at that time in UK and Goldman assured her that he will take her up for the Gleevec trial as soon as it is available to him. However, she still moved further from the Goldman to USA and there Dr. Schaeffer at Detroit Medical Center offered her to be included into the trial for Gleevec. And since then she has been on the Gleevec and there was a complete response in 2000, June 2001 and then over a period of time, almost it's now 30 years, but she was in complete molecular response. So I think before that the molecular response was not available. It's only once it was available she started getting the things done regularly and that's how it went on. Next slide. The important thing was that now she started getting more side effects. I think you can see some of the side effects that there was a periorbital edema, swelling of the face, little weakness in September 2019, for last few years, her BCR able was quantitative was zero, and that's why we had uh, called her complete molecular response. That's the time she was shared the information about that how we can stop the uh, Gleevec, and uh, she obviously because of all these side effects which are happening, she accepted this and she has stopped the Gleevec on October 2019 and today she is here, next slide, look at her, she has changed completely, she is well, side effects have reduced and she is living a normal life. I think that is a whole and you can see that what are the steps that happen, we moved from hydra to transplant to the interferon and ultimately Gleevec and today after exactly 30 years, 2090 was the diagnosis and 2020 she is running around and I think that's a, in short, this really shows you what a progress has occurred. Of course, this is not, this is only the clinical progress which we are seeing but side by side there has been progress in understanding of the biology of the disease and the, its application from uh, the lab to the bedside has clearly produced the tremendous result. I think she may 
join in for one or two minutes. Uh, Shaila, you are here. You can yes, join. Yes, she is here. Yes. So you can join. You can say a few words. Yes. Yeah. Hello, doctors. Yeah. I'm Shaila Bandari from Jaipur. Yes. Uh, you have uh, come. Uh, Doctor Advani has showed all the history of mine. And today I would like to say that it looks like it's coming back. But as I have gone through for so many years with this, I, will uh, I have learned to live with it. Yes, last one year has been without medicine and I enjoyed it, but I believe that I will learn again to live with it. For example, at this moment, I cannot walk straight uh, after getting up from chair because I cannot. I don't have my total balance with me. So I walk sideways, and when I feel I can walk straight, I have gained my balance. This is how I learn with small, small problems and small, small solutions. I believe with all uh, the support of my doctor Advani, who came as a ray of hope in my bright sun and ray of hope in my life. He will keep guiding me to learn to live with it again. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you so much, Dr. Advani, for being there with me. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that's the story of chronic myeloid leukemia. And I'm sure we are going to learn a lot in another today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Advani. Uh, this was really a wonderful journey of chronic myeloid leukemia from a single patient. And that patient is now, uh, I believe, more than 60 years old. So uh, earlier, as you mentioned, the survival for chronic myeloid leukemia was only three years. And now she has been on the disease and on the treatment for more than 30 years. And that's absolutely amazing. So it's really wonderful to hear this story. It is my pleasant duty to talk a little bit about what is the purpose of uh, Dallas or Dr. Adwani's legendary oncology series. So I take you back to the year 1979 when I was a student at uh, St. G.S. Medical College and KEM Hospital. I was in my uh, third year and at that time, which is 41 years ago, uh, Dr. B.C. Mehta was the head of the oncology department, uh, hematology department. And he had organized a conference, which I, you know, attended because Dr. Adwani was there to give a lecture. So that is the first, in 1979, was the first time that I saw Dr. Adwani. And Dr. Gopal was also giving a lecture. One lecture was on bone marrow transplantation, which Dr. Adwani gave, and the other one was on lymphoma, which Dr. Gopal gave. And even after these 41 years, that lecture, those two lectures are etched in my mind as if I have attended them uh, yesterday. I was totally mesmerized by Dr. Adwani, and the name just kept on uh, reverberating in my mind all the time. So while I was a lecturer in hematology at KEM hospital, I was very uneasy and wanted to go and join Tata. And this nobody else knew about it. So finally, I one day I gathered courage and I went and met Dr. Advan. And I said, sir, I am from KEM hospital. I would like to work with you at Tata. He said, there is no vacancy for a resident. If you want to join as a research fellow, please, sir. So it was a big decision to leave a full-time position as a lecturer in a government uh, municipal hospital and come on a position of research fellow, but I was uh, very happy to do that because Dr. Adwani's name was legendary and I could over the years see how it has, you know, matured and nurtured. So the continuing to hear tall stories from about Dr. Adwani made me come and join and that, you know, as they say, is history. Uh, as I, uh, two months after joining as a fellow, a research fellow, I joined as a resident because there was a vacancy. And I could see that all through the day from morning till night, uh, Banavli is a witness to that. 
Banavli and uh, Dr. Bisan Singh Chadak from Jammu. Three of us were residents together. And right from morning till night, we used to work seeing patients. And then in the evening, we would be seeing uh, peripheral blood or bone marrow slides. And it was so amazing to see that Dr. Advani would be there to see the slides. And not only that, after seeing the slides, you would tell the total WBC count of the patient of CMS. And we could not believe our uh, ears at that time. But when we went back and checked the total WBC report of the patient, it was absolutely accurate. And I think that is how the legend of this legendary figure has gone, grown. I also remember the uh, academic round that we had twice a week, which would go on for three, four, six hours. And uh, that really uh, ensured that we would get uh, enamored and uh, interested in uh, academics. Every time we said something, the question that Dr. Adwani asked back was, but where is the data? So that is, I think, 40 years ago, we realized the importance of what data means. And then that mentoring continued. And, uh, you know, uh, all of us have gone abroad. Uh, thanks to the fellowships that were facilitated by Dr. Adwani as a mentor. And then coming back to how the patients were extremely happy. Uh, recently, Dr. Raja took Dr. Adwani's interview for a conference on lung cancer. And I uh, would like to share the two points that he, uh, Dr. Adwani mentioned in that. One was that always smile. As the patient enters the consulting room, he should be greeted with a smiling face and half his worries are over. The second thing he said was never take away hope from the patient. Whether we are able to medically treat the patient, cure the patient, get him better or not, our most important job is to ensure that patient has hope when he leaves the consulting. So this is the message that we got in Tata Hospital and Dr. Advani has continued to convey the message. And this is also reflected in the faith that patients have in him. So whether the patient is inside Mumbai, inside Maharashtra or in a neighboring country, all of them have faith in sir. So much so that I remember one patient had a Hickman catheter, but for the monthly in, uh, uh, infusion and flushing of the catheter, there would be somebody from Dr. Advani's team who would fly to that city, do the flushing and come back because that patient had only faith in what Dr. Advani would do. So that is the power of the faith that we used to uh, you know, experience as a as uh, working under the shadow of Dr. Advan. Today, the reputation of Tata Memorial Hospital and especially medical oncology is because of the foundation of this legendary figure that we uh, call the father of oncology, which is for all of us. And I think this stature is not only for people who have graduated from Tata Hospital, but from for uh, people involved in oncology and hematology across the whole country. So it is uh, no exaggeration to call Dr. Advani sir as father of oncology in India. This is also borne by the various amount of publications, uh, plenary lectures that has, he has given, as well as the government of India recognition that was shown in the slide. I think uh, this is the background of why students, uh, his students got together to develop this. And the other thing is there is an NGO that Dr. Advani has set up called Helping Hand. And this has been quietly doing a lot of work over the last decades for patients with cancer. But uh, now, moving to the next level, Dr. Advani said, I now want to start helping getting free treatment to, for all patients, all needy patients with CML. And that is how CML was chosen as the first topic for this uh, legendary uh, series that we hope to make it annual. The focus of Dallas will be on a single focus topic so that we can discuss everything threadbare in a practical and a meaningful manner. And we also will have a competition uh, and oration in the memory of uh, Dr. Smita Adwani. And that would also be a source of inspiration for all of us. So with these uh, brief uh, statements, I was sharing my thoughts about our legendary teacher as well as the purpose of starting Dallas. 
uh, I hand it over back to Dr. Adwani, and then we'll move on to the next. Thank you, thank you, Kavish. Uh, good words and I think all of us have learned from each other and that's how our knowledge really increases. I always still mention that the more I have learned, not from the books, but from my colleagues during the meetings, during the uh, discussion, that's where you really learn a lot. So I think we should move on now to the... To yeah, the would you like to say something about helping hand and what it wants? Yeah, I think help, uh, yeah, I think helping hand was established about 20 years ago and uh, initially the purpose was to give the financial help to the patients who cannot afford. With that purpose we started, of course it was funded by the public and we had a lot of uh, gatherings and all and that's how the funds were established. Slowly we got interested in the breast cancer and that's where once I was visiting the uh, US and uh, there uh, we found that there's a mobile mammography cam machine in the hospital. So I say, what is this doing? I mean, before that I never knew that mammography machine on wheels. And they say that uh, this is uh, established by the insurance and they make sure that everybody who is insured uh, above the age of 40 they undergo regular mammography and how they do that that they send the uh, this uh, van to all the wherever the people are there who are insured with them and uh, they have to do it once in a year and suppose they don't do it then they are sent later that uh, please make sure that you do the mammography if even after that if somebody is more uh, uh, you know sort of resistant then they send them there that if you don't do it your premium will be increased and that's how they could see that 100 percent of the people who are insured they will go through the mammography and after that we I, when i came back we started uh, collecting the fund for putting on the mammography on the wheels and we were very successfully we were able to do that and I think uh, before the uh, lockout I think uh, the mammography van was doing a wonderful job we did almost something like 30,000 uh, mammography every year or so however after the lockout I think uh, it has go gone into the background and uh, we thought we should do something more and that's where we thought we got interested in the chronic myeloid leukemia. This is one disease for which it's so easy to treat and at the same time you feel bad if somebody cannot afford this drug. Particularly because it is for lifelong. Remember if it was for a year or two or three, everybody can afford it. But since it is lifelong, for some people this may be a luxury. And that's where we thought that we should establish this uh, helping hand who, can, who has enough funding to give the free treatment for lifetime for the patients with the CML who cannot afford. In other words, no CML patient need to uh, go without treatment. There is no reason for them to go without treatment in future in India. So I think with that we have sort of put up this uh, helping hand launches the free treatment for chronic myeloid Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you so much, much, sir. sir. Yeah. Ashish, please go on to the next session. Uh, sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we'll move on to our first session. Our first session is a sponsored session by Lalpath Lab. Our speaker is Dr. Atul Thatai, uh, National Head of the Molecular Diagnostics and Research and Development of Lalpath Labs. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, uh, Kashish. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. It, it is visible. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for inviting uh, Dr. Lal Path Labs as part of this uh, very important session and a very good initiative 
by the entire team. So uh, as we all know that uh, MPL uh, can be divided into CML and non-CML and what we are concentrating as part of this effort is CML. So uh, one of the uh, basic tests which is uh, done as part of the uh, CML workup is the Philadelphia chromosome uh, because the chromosome was first this, uh, noticed uh, in Philadelphia. And as Dr. Advani was pointing out that the natural history of an untreated CML is actually going from a, a chronic phase to an accelerated phase and ultimately into a blast crisis. But uh, thanks to the discovery of this very important chromosome called the Philadelphia chromosome, where there is a 922 translocation, uh, which leads to the overproduction of ABL and thus leukemia. Uh, we were able to uh, have uh, drugs which were able to uh, treat this very uh, important uh, type of leukemia. So what are the usual molecular tests? The tests could be fish, they could be real-time PCRs, uh, sequencing, and that is particularly true for drug resistance. And uh, now lately what we are seeing is the uh, broader panels based on NGS. So if you do a comparison between the various detection techniques uh, for uh, Philadelphia chromosomes, you could do a conventional cytogenetics with the sensitivity of around five to 10%. Fish has uh, more sensitivity, uh, one to 10%, but it is a kind of a semi-quantitative assay. The QR, uh, QRT-PCR, as we call it, the quantitative reverse transcription, real-time PCR, has a very good sensitivity uh, uh, of around 0.001% to around 0.01%. Uh, and then uh, one of the techniques which is not very uh, widely used is a flow cytometric evaluation, uh, which can also be uh, uh, quantitative. But in the Indian context, uh, most of the people uh, currently are using FISH as well as uh, RT-PCR. Uh, FISH has uh, most probably uh, been used as a uh, detection uh, criteria because what you do uh, and what you gain uh, by doing a FISH is that all different kinds of translocations can be covered uh, by using a FISH because the probes are usually uh, very large uh, when you are uh, doing it. Uh, although uh, within fish you are uh, not able to do it very quantitatively, but yes, uh, as a diagnostic thing, uh, fish is definitely uh, one of the preferred methods. The common variants, uh, as we see, is uh, the major BCR, wherein the uh, uh, the breakpoints are usually between exons 12 and uh, 12 to uh, 16 and. E13 uh, and E14 uh, breakpoints are the mo uh, are the most common ones which we find, and this leads to uh, the increase in tyrosine kinase activity and the most common infrequency. And this kind of uh, breakpoints are usually seen in around 90% of the cases. The minor BCR or E1, E2, uh, as we call it, uh, results in the short fusion protein, the P190, and is uh, most frequently associated with Philadelphia positive ALL. And it could be uh, associated in rare cases of CML or uh, CMML uh, also. The micro BCR uh, is a rare thing, uh, uh, E19, A2, and has a larger fusion protein of around uh, 230 uh, uh, kilodaltons. And uh, depending upon what you, uh, where you see the um, uh, breakpoints, you have to design your essay like that, uh, that you are able to uh, uh, cover the majority of the uh, 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 transcripts, what you are seeing. So usually what you have is the reverse primer in the uh, ABL uh, uh, region and uh, the forward primer in the uh, BCR region. And depending upon where you have the breakpoint, you could you would have different kinds of primers to be designed. Uh, the uh, important aspects of a, a quality report is that uh, it should uh, give you the ABL copy numbers, and ABL copy numbers of uh, less than ten thousands are not reported out. 
uh, because you need to have sufficient number of ABL quantities to be able to give you a good sensitive uh, uh, report. You should all, uh, what we also have uh, the reports now carry the historical data so that it becomes easier for uh, the clinician to look at the historical uh, data because uh, there should not be uh, 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 more than a uh, one log difference between the previous value uh, to be clinically relevant. So uh, most of the drugs which are currently uh, in use are the TKI inhibitors because in, uh, the, these drugs can actually go and uh, bind to the ATP binding site uh, so that uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, enzyme itself is uh, uh, deactivated. And the NCCN guidelines uh, definitely look at the various uh, kinds of mutations which could be there uh, and uh, the drug uh, 